Hello biology students, we're going to do lab 4.4 cell respiration stem case. We're going to try to save Jared, the CIA agent, from poisoning. Let's start the gizmos and then we'll answer some questions about what our mission is, who our pa what our patient syndromes are, what role we're playing, and what poison, why poison is the suspect. We're, Navy, we're on a Navy SEAL team going in to rescue the agent. He's on an island controlled by a drug cartel. SEALs will approach underwater to avoid detection and then advance to the compound. I'm glad I don't have this job. I think teaching is tough, but take swimming with a gun underwater probably is much harder. So seals are sneaking up on the compound. They're gonna rescue Jared, and it's gonna be our job to figure out how Jared has been poisoned and what we need to do about it. Poisoning affects cellular respiration, which happens partly in the mitochondria, but also partly in the cytoplasm of the cell. So he's rescued now. Let's go figure out what we need to do. He is 32. He has muscle weakness, shortness of breath, and dizziness. Um, he w shared a meal with one of the suspects of the dr drug cartel. After the meal, he had trouble breathing and felt weak and dizzy. He may have been poisoned. He's going to the CIA hospital, and we better help him. We are a medical toxicologist working for the CIA that diagnoses and treats people who have been poisoned. Poisoning has been used throughout history to get rid of one's enemies by various groups. Um, and it is still sometimes used. All right, let me shut off the dramatic music here. So obviously molecules don't actually have little skulls on them like that. It'd be cool if they did, but um, no. Molecules do not look like a little skull and crossbones. Jared is suffering from muscle weakness, dizziness, and shortness of breath. These symptoms could mean that poison is stopping Jared's cells from making ATP. In other words, they're stopping parts of cellular respiration. ATP is the molecule that cells use as energy. Without ATP, Jared's cells will stop working and Jared could die. If your muscles don't work, you can't breathe. If you can't breathe, you're in trouble. Your heart doesn't beat... Um, uh, well, and if your muscles aren't working, your heart also doesn't beat. If your heart can't beat and you can't breathe, you're in real trouble. To find the right treatment, we'll not need to understand how the body makes ATP. So we're going to dive into the handbook and learn some things about cellular respiration before we go save Jared. So every cell needs energy in the body to live. Here's muscle cells. Muscle cells especially need ATP to contract and move us around. In animals, the source of energy is food. Not everyone eats hamburgers. I know that. You know that. It might be an impossible burger. Food has chemical energy, and the body uses energy to make a molecule called ATP. That's adenosine triphosphate. The tri is for three. You can see the three phosphate groups here as the three orange lumps. No, it's not really orange and blue in your body and doesn't look quite as cartoony. Um, but it's a good model for us to learn about ATP with. ATP stores the energy and is used by many processes in the cell. The production of ATP is an example of metabolism. Metabolism comes from the Greek word to change, metabole, to change. 
So it's changing the chemicals that you eat um, and that go around your body. And it's all those chemical reactions that happen to keep you alive. Glucose or sugar is the molecules most cells use to make ATP. This process is called cellular respiration. Cell respiration, plants also use cell respiration to make ATP from the sugars they make in photosynthesis. So everybody, plants and animals, does cell respiration. Where does it happen? It all goes down in the mitochondrion, or plural, mitochondria. Cell respiration happens in organelles uh, called mitochondria. Let's explore a mitochondria, a mitochondrion, that's singular. It has two membranes, inner and outer. So there's the cytoplasm out here. This is all the cell and the outer membrane of the mitochondria. And then there's an intermembrane space between the membranes. And then there's an inner membrane and the matrix, not the matrix from the movie. This is a mitochondria. The space between the membranes is called the intermembrane space. The inside is called the matrix. Let's take a break here and go over to our lab sheet. Hopefully we know what our mission is now in this STEM case. We need to figure out which poison um, is working on Jared's cellular respiration system. Our patient system, uh, our muscle weakness, dizziness, our patients, uh, what role are we playing? We're a medical toxicologist. Why is poison suspected as the cause of the symptoms? He ingested something and then he felt ill. Also, muscle weakness is somewhat indicative of a poisoning. So if your muscles aren't working well, it might mean that something is disrupting ATP. And if you just ate something and all of a sudden um, you can't make ATP, that would indicate that perhaps you ate something that's poisonous. What does cell respiration do and why is it considered part of metabolism? Well, it takes glucose from the food that we eat and makes it into ATP, a form of usable energy for your cells. Where does it happen? It all goes down in the mitochondrion, or plural, mitochondria. Let's keep going and figure out what are the two inputs for cell respiration here. We need two, it needs two things to work. Number one, glucose from food, sugar from food. Number two, oxygen from the air. You breathe to make cellular respiration work. Respiration is a chemical process, but it's also the process of taking in oxygen. Breathing is important because we need that oxygen to travel around our blood, get dropped off at our cells, and end up at our mitochondria so that we can do cell respiration and make ATP. Those are the inputs or the reactants of cell respiration. The, the ingredients we need to start working. It produces three things. Number one, carbon dioxide. It's what you breathe out. Your blood travels around your body, picks up carbon dioxide from your cells and deliver it back to your lungs and you whoosh, breathe it back out. Carbon dioxide is why we breathe out. Oxygen is why we breathe in. Water is water. Hopefully you know what that is. It's part of the reason when we breathe out, we breathe out water. And it, of course, makes chemical energy in the form of ATP. So this is a very, very simplified version of the formula for cellular respiration. But now you have your inputs and your outputs. So you have question seven and question eight. If you look carefully, the answers are right here. We're now looking for a key concept.
The inputs of cell re respiration are sometimes called reactants, but the sugar and oxygen do not react with each other. It's far more complicated than this simplistic uh, chemical reaction here it, as shown. They are used in different parts of cell respiration, and we're gonna study those parts. So first of all, let's organize our inputs and outputs. So we have ATP is definitely not an input. We know that's what we're trying to make. That's a product of the reaction or an output. An input is sugar. That's C6H12O6, that's in the things that we eat. Carbon dioxide goes in outputs. That's why we breathe out. We're getting rid of that, it's a waste product. We don't want it in our body. Uh, H2O is great, we always need water. It's not really a waste product, it's just an output, our body will use it, or we'll breathe it out. And oxygen is the other thing we need to get the reaction going. Let's see if we're right. Oh, awesome. So here's cell respiration in four steps. Before we get going, look at all these different shapes here. All those shapes are enzymes. You can see that there are a lot of enzymes in this process, and it's a very complex process. We're gonna gloss over a lot of the details here, um, but in further courses, you may need to know more details. Each one of these enzymes does a particular process. If you mess up one of those enzymes, you don't do cellular respiration well anymore, and you're going to have problems. There are four steps we're gonna break it down into. The first is glycolysis, then the Krebs cycle, then the electron transport chain, and then this is ATP synthase. We're gonna click on glycolysis first. Glycolysis takes place in the cytoplasm. So this part of cellular respiration takes place outside of the mitochondria, in the cytoplasm, and splits glucose into two molecules called pyruvate. So it takes a glucose and breaks it in half and makes two three carbon molecules called pyruvate. Glyco means sugar and lysis means to split. So we're splitting sugar. We're basically breaking open the sugar and breaking it in half, and each of those halves is called pyruvate. That's an oversimplification, but it's an easy way to get our brains around it. Glycolysis uses a whole bunch of different enzymes to do this breaking of sugar, or splitting of sugar. In the process, it makes just two ATPs. So glycolysis makes two ATPs. Glycolysis is not the main source for ATPs. Most ATP is made in the mitochondria. The pyruvate, pyruvate that we pr produce in glycolysis is gonna go down to the matrix and get used by the Krebs cycle. But before we explore that, let's go to, over to our lab sheet. We know from the key concept, um, sugar and oxygen do not actually react with each other. They are used in different parts of glycolysis, but in the overall equation, um, those are what we need to start with. So at this point, we, need, we know that glycolysis, broken down into the two word parts, glyco and lysis, means splitting sugar. It happens in the cytoplasm, and it happens because of one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten different enzymes. That's pretty impressive. We're going to have a little accounting here. We know that glycolysis makes two ATP and two pyruvate. This is important because different parts of cellular respiration make different things make different amounts of ATP, and they also make other products that are used by the next step. So the next step is the Krebs cycle. So let's transport pyruvate. 
from glycolysis, and you can see that there are some pores in the membrane here. Um, remember, a pore is just like a hole in the membrane that is a special door for a particular molecule. Cell membranes are complicated. A lot of things can't get through unless they have permission or a special sort of VIP entrance. And this pore here is sort of a VIP entrance for pyruvate. So let's zoom in on the Krebs cycle. You can see pyruvate comes in. There's a whole bunch of enzymes and a lot of rearranging of um, atoms. And we have an NADH made and an ATP made. Now we say it's two because two pyruvate come in here for every glucose. So this kind of goes around twice, once for each pyruvate and we get two pyruvate from each glucose. So it makes ATP and it makes NADH. Carbon dioxide is made as a waste product. That can cross the cell membrane on its own, heads out of the mitochondria, eventually makes its way out of the cell into your bloodstream, and you breathe it out. True or false, glycolysis joins glucose to other molecules to make pyruvate. Well, glycolysis means splitting sugar. So it's basically taking sugar and breaking it in half. So I don't think this is true. All right, they're reminding us that glyco means sugar and lysis means to split and glycolysis means to split sugar. What, what does the Krebs cycle use to make NADH? Well, the thing that comes into the Krebs cycle from glycolysis is that half of a sugar. We've split sugar, and now it's pyruvate. Now we're ready to go to step three. Let's go over here to our counting side. So the Krebs cycle makes two ATP and two NADH for each glucose. It's one ATP to two per pyruvate, but we made two pyruvate up here. So per glucose, we get two ATP and two NADH out of the Krebs cycle. Let's go look at the electrons transport chain here. That's step three, that's the blue part. So it's a group of proteins in the inner membrane of the mitochondria. Remember the mitochondria has two membranes, an outer one and an inner one, and this part is called the matrix. This part between the membranes is called the intermembrane space. As the electrons move along the system of proteins, um, the H plus concentration goes up in the intermembrane space. And that's significant when we get to part four. We're gonna use all that H plus that's been stored up between the membranes to make a whole bunch of ATP. Let's transport some electrons in our electron transport chain. The electrons go along. And as the electrons travel along, more and more H plus is built up here in the intermembrane space. Oxygen comes in and picks up a couple of these hydrogens and makes water. Makes the electrons leave and this is why we need oxygen to do cellular respiration because we need oxygen to pick up those H plus ions and make water. Without oxygen, electrons would not be able to leave the electron transport chain. This is why animals need oxygen to live. This is why you breathe. What happens to the concentration of H plus in the intermembrane space and the matrix as electrons move down the electron transport chain? Well, we know the H plus concentration 
increases. There's no way for that H plus to get out in the electron transport chain. It leaves via the, um, the next part of cellular respiration. H plus is a charged ion. It has a plus, so it's not going to go through the membrane very well because we know that polar molecules like water don't go through the cellular membrane well unless they have like a special door or pore to go through. They need sort of a VIP entrance because the cellular membrane doesn't welcome polar molecules through. Or charged molecules. Oops, I skipped a step. So as electrons move down the ETC, the hydrogen ions move into this intermembrane space. This creates a high concentration of H plus in that space. Because the H plus are moving into the intermembrane space from the matrix, this makes the concentration of H plus in the matrix low. So we have a low concentration of H plus and we have a high concentration of H plus. And remember from diffusion that um, uh, passive transport will move things from areas of high concentration to low concentration. That's what diffusion is. Um, the concentration of atoms or molecules evening out. And the atoms or molecules moving across a space to make that happen. And it's not a, a, a directed movement, it's a random movement because at, all atoms and molecules have kinetic energy and that kinetic energy distributes things randomly and tends to even out concentrations. So hydrogen ions are used in the last step of cell respiration. Personally, I think this is the coolest step. Let's check it out. Step four is called ATP synthase. But wait, we should go to our lab sheet here. We didn't make any um, ATP in the electron transport chain, but we did make an H plus concentration in the intermembrane space. All right. You win a couple free answers here. What are the inputs for the Krebs cycle? Well, we know it's pyruvate from glycolysis. The outputs of the Krebs cycle are one ATP and one ADH per pyruvate. So that's two ATP and two NADH per glucose. Because remember, we make two pyruvate for every glucose. Why do you need oxygen? Well, you need oxygen to come over here and pick up those electrons. And make water. What happens to the concentration of H plus ions in the intermembrane space as the electrons move down the ATC? Well, here's your answer right here you get a high concentration of H plus ions. All right, let's go back to ATP synthase. The ETC moved a lot of H plus A ions into this intermembrane space. The concentration of H plus is now high in that space. Here's high concentration, here's low concentration. That means that there's a concentration gradient for H plus across the membrane. Choose the arrow that shows the direction H plus will diffuse. So we know that H plus is gonna go from an area of high concentration to low concentration because that's how diffusion works. Ions and molecules move from high concentration to low concentration. 
if it's passive transport. Active transport's a different story. So hydrogen ions are very small and they cannot cross the membrane. That's because they have an electric charge. So charged molecules can't go through the cell membrane. Hydrogen ions need help to diffuse across the membrane. Da 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 da, this is where HTP synthase comes in. Here's HTP synthase and we'll see how it works. Here's your key concept that we're looking at right now. Hydrogen what need help to diffuse across the membrane? What are we moving? And if there was no blank gradient, no blank would move through HTP synthase and ATP would not be made. I'll give you a hint. This is what's going to move through HTP synth or ATP synthase. So let's watch those H plus ions do some work. So ADP is adenosine diphosphate. It has two phosphates. ATP is adenosine triphosphate. So we're going to stick this phosphate on ADP and make ATP, adenosine triphosphate. Right now it only has two. We're going to add one more in ATP synthase and make ATP. So let's do just that. Let's do it again. So ADP and, and phosphate go in and ATP, adenosine triphosphate, comes out. It went in with two, it came out with three. Basically it's kind of like a little Play-Doh fun factory for squishing on that um, extra phosphate. It's a chemical reaction and it happens, and it happens well in ATP synthase, which is an enzyme, because um, the ADP and the phosphate can achieve the right conformation. They can bump into each other in the right way to um, make ATP. If there was no H plus gradient, no H plus would move through ATP synthase and ATP would not be made. So ATP synthase makes 34 ATP. This is where most of the ATP gets made. Some ATP is made in glycolysis in the Krebs cycle, but most of ATP is made by ATP synthase. So if you've got a poison blocking ATP synthase, you've got problems. For each molecule of glucose, glycolysis and the Krebs cycle makes two molecules of ATP each, but the ETC and ATP synthase working together make 34 molecules of ATP. That's pretty mind blowing, it's pretty cool. Let's go up to our kind of accounting chart here and fill in for ATP synthase. ATP synthase makes 34 ATPs. That's pretty darn cool. So question 22, you just need to fill in the blanks from this particular statement here. So look for the blanks, look at the statement, and fill in the blanks. Where does the H plus come from that makes ATP synthase work? Well, it's this part right here. We know it's the blue part and that's called the electron transport chain. That's the ETC. All right, we will start up again, putting these steps in the correct order. So see part two to finish the lab.